This is the third and final lesson in Unit 1, and um, today we're talking about federalism, which is found in Chapter 3 of your textbook. So where did federalism come from? Um, where did our form of government come from? What did the Constitutional Convention want for the federal government? How did the Founding Fathers see this whole um, government, uh, United States experiment thing playing out? Um, well, the one thing the federal, I mean, the one thing the Founding Fathers did not want was a strong central government. They had been there. They had they had seen how that works. They had um, had a strong central government from um, being part of uh, Britain. And so they saw how a strong central government worked. They wanted a weak central government, but a strong state government. So more power pushed down to the state level. So under the Articles of Confederation, um, the provision was that the states alone had authority over the people and the federal government could not tax or regulate economic activities. So that gave the state all the power to tax the people. Um, so for example, um, there would be no federal income tax, there would only be state income taxes. And if you are a born and raised Texan, um, you haven't paid state income tax. So um, in other states besides Texas, it, you pay your federal income tax on April 15th, like everybody else in the United States does now. Um, but you also pay, if you um, pay state income tax, you pay another tax on top of that. And so, um, but at that time of the Articles of Confederation, there were only state income taxes. Um, so if Georgia and North Carolina, for example, didn't contribute anything to the national bank account, basically, the national treasury, nothing could happen because the federal government had no power over those states and um, could not extract taxes from those states. So, um, then there were problems with states having all the power um, and the um, founding fathers had to argue or had to wrestle with the question of do we give the federal government authority over the people directly or authority over them indirectly or um, is there some other way to um, structure this government so that we don't have a strong central government but we do um, still have some kind of accountability um, among the states. Patrick Henry, one of the founding fathers from Virginia, said, who authorized them to speak the language of we the people instead of we the states? So that was the kind of expressed the sentiment um, is, you know, are we a collection of states or are we a collection of people? So what was the answer? Do we get rid of the states altogether and just have everybody living together? The federal government governs everything and the state governments don't have any power. In fact, there wouldn't even be state governments. Um, people had thought of themselves though, up to this time, not as Americans, but people would talk about, um, you know, that person's a Virginian and that person's a Georgian. And, um, not thinking of everybody as an American. Um, I know I reference a lot of Hamilton, um, the musical, in this class because it actually really is a good way to think about um, kind of how this founding father, you know, jockeying for power um, time was and um, how, you know, people thought of, you know, those people, the Virginians, are different than us. We are, you know, we are more level-headed. We are, you know, fill in the blank. Um, Georgians, for example. Um, before the United States Constitution, sovereignty was indivisible. And so what we're going to talk about now is sovereignty, which is um, 
the ability or the power to govern. So before the Constitution, um, the power to govern was indivisible. This means that the supreme and final governing authority, which is the definition of sovereignty, was unable to be apportioned between more than one body. So um, you couldn't have states have some power, federal has some power. It was, you know, one or the other, basically. You either had, um, you either had small little divisions of um, land and those people had power and they had sovereignty or you had one other sovereign being like one other centralized being um, for example like the monarchy or the parliament that um, was the the power to the supreme and final governing authority if the sovereignty is with the national government it's called a unitary system so if all the power to govern is with the central government, then it's called, it's unitary, meaning there's only one government that is um, governing the people. Um, when the national government gives, its, gives the authority, then the national government can take the authority away, meaning if um, the national government gives a power to the states, then this, the national government would be able to come back and take that power away from the states. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, if the sovereignty or the supreme and final governing authority is with the state governments, then it's called a confederacy because the state government is the one who has all the authority. And if they um, give the authority, then they can take the authority away. Um, the, the Confederacy is the opposite of a unitary system, and it is putting all of its power um, power in the states. The prevailing thought um, was, you know, in line with what Thoreau said of the government that governs the least governs the best, meaning um, basically stay out of our business and let um, society go about you know, its business, let the people do the things that they want to do, um, and that's the best way to, um, to govern. But we found that um, when there is no authority and a centralized government, um, it's a pure confederacy government, uh, government then um, there's problems with public disorder, there's problems with economic chaos, there's problems with no centralized defense. So if somebody, you know, attacks, um, for example, Virginia by sea, um, then, actually, I don't know if you, yes, you can attack Virginia by sea. Sorry, had a little bit of a, a geography um, lapse there. If you can attack a Virginia by sea, then, um, Nobody, you know, basically Virginia is the only one who can um, defend those people and they can really only defend them once they get up along their shore. Um, and so when you don't have a centralized government, you don't have a centralized military. So the founding fathers, in their wisdom, um, and I'm not saying that facetiously, but in their wisdom, they invented something called federalism. And federalism is the sharing of authority between um, state and national government. So it's a split authority where um, the national government governs residents in its lane and the state government govern governs the residents within its lane. It's the same, um, same people that are being governed by the federal government and the, and the state government, but um, it's certain aspects of people's lives are governed by the national government and some are governed by certain other aspects are governed by state governments. The national government um, cannot take all the power away from the state governments or abolish the state governments and the state governments cannot abolish the federal governments. They work together and um, coexist side by side in their governing powers, but one doesn't have supreme power over the other. So there are um, kind of, you know, there are 
ways to think about this as some of the powers are only national powers, meaning the state doesn't have any right to do any of those things. Some of the powers are just state powers, meaning the national govern government cannot get involved in those areas. And then some are concurrent powers, meaning um, you know, they can each do those things. Um, we'll talk about like taxation, like I said before, um, you can pay federal income tax and you can pay state taxes as well. So both of those, there's a concurrent power to tax um, people. So let's talk about national powers. National powers are things that you can kind of think of um, as covering, you know, as, as applying to and benefiting everybody in the United States. So um, the national defense, it benefits all of us to have an army or some sort of a national defense, a navy. Um, currency, national currency, we are glad that we don't have 50 different currencies. And so every time you drive across the state border to Oklahoma, you have to exchange all your money um, because the currency is not the same. That is something that is only left up to the federal government. Post office is a national power, which um, seems illogical because, again, you want um, the post office, the postal system, to work on a national level so that you can mail letters to Louisiana and you can mail letters to Washington and Oregon. Foreign affairs, um, if we're going to be one country, we need to have a unified front um, in the foreign conversation. And so we want to have um, just one voice speaking in foreign affairs. And then interstate commerce, meaning commerce between the states, um, is governed by the national government. So um, how, you know, um, businesses can, you know, exchange goods and services across state lines is governed by the national government. Things like the highway system, that is, helps people get goods and services from one state to another state. Um, so interstate with an E is um, between the states. So let's talk about state powers, which are on the other end of the spectrum. State powers, um, states are able to charter local governments, the, the central government, the national government has no power over um, whether or not you can establish townships in your state or counties or, um, you know, cities or towns or what, how the local governments are established. Um, education is a state power. That's um, why you see educational um, rates that vary so much state by state. Some, um, some states do significantly better in, in public education than other states. And that is something that, um, you know, how things are taught and what is taught is something that um, is governed by the state. You know, for example, in Texas, um, you take Texas government and um, the federal government classes when you are in college. Um, what's funny is no other um, states have that. And so when I tell people from other states, um, yes, I teach Texas government and federal government, they're like, whoa, 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 people take Texas government classes? And I say, well, yeah, it's a required class as part of the core curriculum. And so that's something that is completely foreign to people in other states. And so that's just a difference in the education um, requirements and the education structure, but, uh, you know, among the different states. Public safety is a state power. So when you see police, um, firefighters, things like that, those, those groups are um, state run and state regulated. Um, and if you think about it, it's because there are different um, requirements for public safety in different places. You know, public safety issues in New York City are much different than public safety issues in Montana. So you have to staff differently. You have to um, allot different resources to those groups. Um, registration and voting is um, a state power, as we talked about earlier. 
um, in an earlier lecture that um, the Constitution gives the states the rights to um, set the time, place, and manner of the um, voting, um, you know, how voting occurs. And then intrastate commerce, so with an A, intrastate commerce is basically commerce that happens inside the state. So um, the state of Texas will regulate, you know, the sell, sale of tobacco um, within the state of Texas. Now, concurrent powers, those are powers that um, the national power has some, the national government has some, the state government has some. So lending and borrowing money, the national government can do that, but so can the state government. Taxation, like I talked about, um, the, the federal government can tax something and tax the people, tax some goods and services, and the state can do the same. Um, law enforcement is um, something that is federal, so that's something that there is a um, federal interest to some level, but there's also a state interest. And so um, that's why there are, you know, um, federal crimes and state crimes. There are federal, there's a federal court system and a state court system. And, um, you know, for example, let's talk about the death penalty. So, um, there's a federal death penalty statute and there's a state death penalty statute. Each of those, um, those governments have the ability to impose the death penalty, but, um, it's, you know, imposed very differently depending on the crime that was committed and the, um, the, the government that is, you know, whether it's the federal government or the state government who is um, punishing that crime. Both state and federal government can charter banks and both are um, able to control transportation. So, um, for example, we have the Trinity Railway Express or um, the T or DART, um, and those are things that are governed by the state government. And then we have things like, um, you know, the airlines and the railroads, and those are governed by the national government. So what are the good things about federalism? Um, Federalism is really a great form of government in that it has checks and balances, which means that um, there are certain um, forms of government that, you know, the, the state can check the national government and not let the national government get too powerful, and the same can happen on the other side. Um, the federal government can make sure the state doesn't do something that is... Um, you know, completely wild and crazy and um, completely in violation of, um, you know, federal principles. Alexander Hamilton wrote in the Federalist Papers, if the people's rights are invaded by either, they can make use of the other as an instrument of redress. So if your rights are violated by the state government, you can complain to the federal government and try to get relief and vice versa. Also, federalism is less likely to have a dominant faction, so there's not going to be um, a dominant, um, you know, a dominant group in the federal, like a dominant federal government and a dominant or a dominant state government because they both have to work together. They both have certain rights and responsibilities and um, they have, you know, certain spheres that they operate in. James Madison wrote in Federalist 10, extend the sphere and you take in a greater variety of parties and interests. You make it less probable that a majority of the whole will have a common motive to invade the rights of other citizens. And so here he's saying, for example, um, one political party is not going to be able to rule everything. And we see that in our government today, how, um, you know, Republicans may be in power in the Senate and the House, and Democrats may be in power in the House, and then that can flip in the next election. Um, and, you know, we have a Republican president, we have a Democratic president, we go back and forth. And um, because of federalism, because there are just so many different interests involved, um, it divides 
the factions and it um, prevents there being just one ruling party for all of time. So how do you know which power is a federal power and which power is a state power? Um, they are divided into two different kinds. There are enumerated and implied powers. So enumerated are things that are specifically spelled out and implied are things that aren't spelled out specifically, but they, um, you, you derive that power from um, something else that is stated in the Constitution. Um, what the Constitution says is that whatever it does not enumerate as something that is given to the national government, it's reserved to the states. So the default is the states and only the specific things that are spelled out in the Constitution as enumerated to Congress or to the federal government um, will be left up to the states. So Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution gives certain powers to Congress. Um, and then Article 1, Section 10 prohibits the states from doing certain things. And so that is where we figure out what exactly is um, a state power versus a national power. Article 6 says the laws of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. That's called the Supremacy Clause, and that gives, um, it gives the Constitution its own power. So it um, is what you can look to to see, okay, the Constitution, we have to follow what the Constitution says, and then let's look at Article 1, Section 8 and Article 1, Section 10 to see what the Constitution actually says. So what does um, the Constitution give to um, Congress? The power to lay and collect taxes and pay debts. So that's the power to tax. To provide for the common defense and general we welfare, meaning you can, um, that's kind of two parts, you can provide for the common defense with a national um, you know, Navy and Army and Marines and national defense, and then also general welfare, meaning you can provide some level of basic services to everyone in the United States. Think Medicare, Medicaid. Um, the federal government has the power to borrow money and to regulate commerce. So to make sure that there is no um, you know, one group of businesses that is running away with um, with a certain sector of business. There's not one, um, you know, faction that is preventing others from um, from doing business. You know, in a in a way that's fair. Also, you can see this is where we get um, the Fed, the federal. Um, the, the Treasury Department, the um, Federal Reserve that will set interest rates in order to help keep the economy stable. Um, the federal government has the power to um, establish bankruptcy law. And so um, bankruptcy law, when you see that a, a company is filing for bankruptcy, it is the same law whether the, the company is in New York or in Texas or anywhere in between. Um, bankruptcy law is something that is governed by um, the national government and Congress. Um, establish naturalization rules. So what does it take to become a citizen of the United States? Obviously, that's something that um, Congress is, is able to say. Um, coin money. So again, we don't want 50 different currencies. And so the Congress or the federal government has the power to coin money. Punish counter counterfeiters. So that is what um, one of the primary jobs are of the Secret Service is to identify and punish counterfeiters. And that goes just right alongside um, the, coining, the power to coin money. Establishing post offices, as we talked about before, you want um, there to be some centralized governing body that will get your letter you write to 
Oregon when you put it in the mailbox. Um, the federal government has the power to um, regulate and protect intellectual property. So you don't want you know, your idea to only be protected in Texas and then somebody from Oklahoma steal your idea and, um, and start you know, creating the product there. Um, it, intellectual property is protected on a national level. So when you get a patent, it applies everywhere in the United States. Establishing courts. So um, there are federal courts and there's federal bankruptcy courts, there's federal criminal courts, there's federal district um, civil courts. And those are um, courts that can, can enforce laws, um, the federal laws, over all of the people in the United States. Um, Congress has the power to punish pirates and felonies at sea. And this is another kind of common sense thing. Um, you know, the, the state boundaries generally end a few um, miles outside of the um, shoreline. And so what if somebody is smack dab in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and um, commits a crime? Whose state law do we prosecute that crime under? Um, because really they're just floating out in the middle of the ocean. Um, well, we would punish it as a federal crime because there has to be somebody who is watching over, um, watching over crimes and, and able to punish crimes. They're committed, um, you know, in open waters. The um, Congress has the power to declare war. You don't want, you know, um, somebody in Idaho popping off and declaring war against Mexico. And um, we're all sitting in Texas saying like, whoa, 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 wait a second. We're not all on the same page here. So you want the federal government to be the only one who can declare war against another country. Raise an army for two years. So um, again, Congress is, um, is able to um, determine if an army um, is you know, going to be established or sent out or um, is going to be activated. Maintain a navy, same thing. We're all talking about providing for the common defense. Call up a militia. Um, if there are militias, then the government can call those up and ask them to, um, to come provide for the common defense. And then um, they have power um, over the District of Columbia um, and federal lands. So um, national parks, the federal government has power over those. They are able to um, allot money to them, determine if they should be um, you know, how they should be maintained, um, what kind of, you know, culling of animals is allowed or not allowed on those lands. Um, and the same with the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia is, um, is a city that's not part of any state. And so, you know, somebody has to decide who's going to pick up trash and um, who's going to hire the police officers. And so the federal government has state-like powers over the District of Columbia. So implied powers are things that are not specifically stated, like the power to coin money, but are, um, the term is necessary and proper, but are necessary and proper to conduct some other power that's given to the government. So, um, Congress has the power to make all laws that are necessary and proper to carry out their powers. So um, when Congress has a power to coin money, then they can do anything necessary and proper to get that money coined. They can um, enter into a contract with someone to build a building for, you know, that will hold the, the money coining machines. They have, um, you know, the power to hire people to cut the grass on that, um, you know, on that land. They have the power to negotiate contracts with, um, you know, labor organizations that um, will employ people to work at those facilities, things like that.
This is an elastic clause that lets the, the Constitution adapt and survive. So without this kind of um, vagueness built into the Constitution, the Constitution would have to constantly be amended every time something else came up or um, there would just be a complete um, chaos with different um, issues arising and having to figure out how that fits in the Constitution. And if it doesn't fit, what do we do about it? So the Tenth Amendment was um, enacted in 1791. And um, the Tenth Amendment was enacted to address concerns from anti-federalists, meaning people who didn't like this form of government, um, based on the Supremacy Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause. So if you're an anti-federalist and you don't believe that there should be a strong central government and your um, constitution now says the strong central government has the power to do anything that's necessary and proper. And all, oh, by the way, this government's um, document is the supreme law of the land, then that makes you really uncomfortable. Um, so, in order to address that, um, the Tenth Amendment says that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited to it by it um, to the states are reserved to the states so this is just another kind of catch-all that says if you know if the um, power has not been prohibited by the constitution as something that the states can do um, or specifically given to the national government then we're just going to default believe that um, it is a state power so this looked like something um, that was going to really benefit the states and really appease the federal, the anti-federalists um, and give the states a lot more power than it actually has. Um, there is, um, you know, a lot of, like I said, vagueness written into the Constitution with um, the Necessary and Proper Clause. And that um, really allows the national government to be as strong as, um, as it wants to be. And um, there really hasn't been, there wasn't a shift in power in 1791 from the national government to you know, the state governments then being the supreme law of the land or anything like that. So basically, um, federalism has progressed in kind of three different um, eras or three different periods of time. So um, there was 1789, which is the effective date of the Constitution, until the Civil War, and then after the Civil War to 1937, and then in 1937, which was the start of Franklin D. Roosevelt's second term to the present, have been the three different kind of um, ways we can break up and see how um, federalism has progressed throughout those three periods of time. So part one is from the time that the Constitution became effective and through the Civil War. So there were some um, early conflicts, as you can imagine, when um, when a document is new, this form of government that's just been invented is brand new. We can't really even look to anybody to tell us, um, you know, what should we be doing here? Um, one of the early conflicts was a national bank. So Alexander Hamilton, who was a Federalist, believed in Federalism, wrote the Federalist Papers, or some of them at least, um, said that the power to establish a bank was implied in the Constitution because a bank is necessary and proper to regulate currency. So we know that the federal government, the national government, is the one who is able to um, regulate currency, coin money, things like that. And so Hamilton said, okay, we can, you know, the federal government can establish banks because you have to have a bank in order to um, regulate how much cash is flowing out there. Now Thomas Jefferson, who is an anti-federalist, so um, being super nervous about the federal government getting way too much power, 
through the necessary proper clause and through um, the supremacy clause of you know the Constitution being the supreme law of the land said well wait a second when I read the Constitution there is no expressed power given to the national government to establish bank so establishing a bank must be left to the states because remember because of the Tenth Amendment the only thing that um, the national government has is things that's been specifically given and um, things that are not prohibited to the states. So since a bank has not been prohibited to the states um, and it has not been specifically given to the national government, then it must be only a state, right? State banks didn't want to compete with a national bank and they wanted, you know, they thought we'll never survive if it's, um, you know, Texas State Bank versus the United States Bank. Um, and so what happened when the national government established some national banks that operated in a state, the states taxed those banks. So, um, you know, on one corner you have the Texas Bank, the other corner you have the United States of America Bank, and then Texas would say, well, wait a second, we want to be able to, we want our banks to be able to compete with the federal government's banks, which have many more resources and are much more powerful. So we're going to impose a tax on the national bank in order to, um, you know, keep them in check and keep them um, so that we are competitive. Um, the national bank said, no, thank you. We are the national bank. We're not paying state taxes. We'll pay national taxes, but we're not paying state taxes. And so when the federal banks um, refused to pay a Maryland state tax, there was a Supreme Court case that is very famous called McCullough versus Maryland. So McCullough versus Maryland um, held, and this is the United States Supreme Court, held that it was reasonable to infer that a government with powers to tax, borrow money, and regulate commerce could establish a bank and exercise those powers. It's not that the Constitution didn't give Congress and the federal government anything to do with money and um, things that happen at banks. And so since there were some things that happen at banks um, in the powers that were specifically given to Congress, the Supreme Court said it's reasonable to infer that a government with these powers has a power to establish a bank. And, you know, this was something that was implied through the Necessary and Proper Clause. And um, the Supreme Court pointed out specifically that, um, you know, there has to be, there is some gray area that, um, you know, the, the federal government cannot be limited to only the things that are stated in the United States Constitution. There's nothing in there about a bank. And so um, the, the national government cannot be so um, hamstrung by the um, Constitution that it can only do the things that are listed in the Constitution. Um, even though there's a supremacy clause, um, the national government had enough power and enough other areas that it could be implied that there was a right to establish a bank. And so with that right to establish a bank, it also had a right to protect the bank from the state levying taxes against it. Um, so here in within the corners of the, you know, within the walls of the national bank, the state did not have power to levy taxes or frankly do anything. Um, that was, you know, a national um, entity. And so the national government had power there. A little bit later, um, we had a case Gibbon versus Ogden, which is, um, an issue involving monopolies. So in New York, there was a law that let one of its residents um, have a monopoly on operating the ferry 
that went between New York and New Jersey. So if you haven't been to New York or you are not really familiar with that area, um, New York and New Jersey, um, New York City and New Jersey um, are separated by um, a body, a small body of water you can see from one side to the other. And if you want to get from one side, you know, from New York to New Jersey, you can drive across the bridge or you can take a ferry. And so New York law said that um, it's a New Yorker who's the only one who's able to operate a ferry that traveled between the two states. Um, the national government said New York had encroached on the power to regulate interstate commerce. So regulate commerce that happens between New York and New Jersey. And, um, and so the Supreme Court held that um, New York could not say that only a New Yorker can operate this ferry that travels between New York and New Jersey, that that um, is something that um, commerce that happens between New York and New Jersey would um, be something that is regulated in Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce. Um, so you're thinking, you know, you just think about it like maybe all the boats were docked in New York. Um, well, people who were in New Jersey wanted to build docks and they wanted to dock ferries and they wanted to charge a fare where people from New Jersey paid to ride the boat from New Jersey to New York and people from New York then could pay and ride the boat from New York to New Jersey and things like that. And so this was um, another example of the Supreme Court early on in um, the life of the Constitution um, interpreting the Constitution to expand national power and strengthen the national government so that it didn't just become a collection of states again, or like the Articles of Confederacy, um, and giving the states all of the rights and um, not making the states kind of um, checked to the power of the national government. So you can think about it um, and think about where you think we'll have our next national versus straight state struggle. Um, there are lots of areas in even today's, um, today's society where um, there is a struggle between, you know, whose law is going to apply. You can think of things like um, the regulation of marijuana. So who is in charge of determining whether or not recreational marijuana can be legal? Um, can the federal government say that it, you know, it is or is not um, because it is able to regulate interstate commerce and so far as, you know, carrying marijuana across state lines? Um, or is it left up to the states because it is not something that has been prohibited by the states? It's also not something that is enumerated to the federal government. So there's lots of places where we may have our next national state struggle. That's one that I'm predicting will come along fairly soon. So let's talk about what laid the groundwork um, for the Civil War. Um, John C. Calhoun's Doctrine of Nullification um, was um, brought about because there was one of these national versus state struggles with respect to um, slavery. And so some states were um, in favor of slavery and, and allowed slavery within their borders. Some states did not. This is something that we know from our history class. Um, and so was this, was slavery going to be something that was a, um, a national issue that the national government could regulate? Or was this going to be something that the states were going to be able to retain power over? Because again, it is not necessarily something that is um, enumerated in Article 1, Section 8 and has not been um, prohibited by the states, by the Constitution.
the doctrine of nullification said the national government is a government of states, not a government of individuals. And as such, a state could declare a national law null and void. Um, so this happened because um, the Southerners who were in favor of slavery saw that power was shifting and power was tipping in favor of free states. Um, there was a lot more immigration in free states. There was a lot more um, expansion of economy in free states. Um, a lot more was happening in free states. You can think about this logically. Why do you think more was happening in free states? Why do you think people wanted to live in free states? Maybe because they were free. And so um, with the expansion of power in the free states, the South, instead of saying maybe we should be free states too, so we can have a lot of power, said, wait a second, we don't want the, um, you know, the, the government to be able to be controlled by the free states in the North, because that's where, where the government was um, in New York. And so um, the South wanted to retain enough power in the national government um, so that slavery could be um, still maintained. Um, and so um, John C. Calhoun wanted the power of the states to be able to nullify a um, federal law should the power all, you know, should the national government soon be controlled by all free states and people with those kind of ideals and those people tried to um, enact a national law that affected slavery. He wanted the south southern states to be able, the slave states, to be able to say, we're not going to follow that law. Um, so Congress in South Carolina in 1832, um, South Carolina declared um, a national tariff null and void. Um, and Andrew Jackson took military action against South Carolina because South Carolina was um, trying to nullify a national tariff. Um, with all of this, you know, kind of brewing and the um, right on the, you know, the tip of the, um, the eve of the Civil War, um, tensions were high. And um, as a result of, you know, Andrew Jackson taking military action against South Carolina, because of this tariff, Congress agreed to revise the Tariff Act um, and South Carolina backed down instead of fighting back and declaring you know, the, the tariff um, null and void. And so basically everything just cooled down for a few minutes, um, obviously not cooled down forever, but cooled down for a few minutes um, and kind of tabled the discussion about this, um, whether or not the states had the power to nullify um, a national law. So the Dred Scott decision is a famous um, Supreme Court decision in 1857, and um, it helps if you have a little bit of a background about Mr. Scott um, himself. Mr. Scott was born into slavery in Virginia, and then he moved from Virginia to Alabama, also a slave state, and then to Missouri, and then that owner died, and he was purchased by another owner who moved from Missouri to Illinois, which was a free state, and then moved to Wisconsin, another free state, and then back to St. Louis, slave state, and then to Louisiana, slave state, back to Wisconsin, free state, Louis St. Louis, slave state, Iowa, and then back to St. Louis, slave state. And this all happened between 1799 and 1843. So during his whole life, he'd been moving back and forth and back and forth, slave state, free state, slave state, free state. Now, when states were being admitted, this is during the time when states were being admitted to the Union, so to the United States. And in order to keep their the balance of power, um, slave states and free states were admitted at the same time. So basically, if you were a slave state, 
you um, would be admitted alongside a free state. Um, and the next slide will we'll kind of talk about that. Um, so in 1820, Missouri is admitted as a slave state and Maine is its partner and it is admitted as a free state. Um, and also at that time, slavery is banned in all former Louisiana purchase lands north of basically Missouri's southern border, 36 degrees, um, 30 minutes latitude. So what that means is that Dred Scott was moving between slave state, free state, slave state, free state, and um, he ended up in St. Louis. Um, so he um, applied for freedom when his owner died and um, this was pursuant to the Missouri Compromise that made slavery illegal in a free state and a Missouri law that said once you were free, you couldn't be re-enslaved. So, um, so Dred Scott finds himself living in the North and wanting to be um, obviously freed from slavery. Um, the Supreme Court held that since Dred Scott was not a citizen because slaves were not considered citizens, he had no right to petition the court. But the um, Supreme Court also invalidated the Missouri Compromise by saying slaves are property, not people. And since Congress cannot interfere with property rights, Congress cannot interfere with slavery. And so this was the Supreme Court saying to the people in the South who were very nervous about whether or not um, Congress would ban slavery because, you know, everybody in the North was becoming more powerful. This was um, the Supreme Court assuring the South that slavery would remain. So with that assurance from um, the national courts, the Supreme Court, um, the Civil War broke out. So I talked about on the last, in the last slide, that um, different states were admitted kind of in pairs. And so um, you can see that, you know, between um, the beginning, the original 13 colonies, um, and the 1860s, mid-1860s, after the Civil War, states were admitted, um, you know, for example, um, the green are the free states, the blue are the um, slave states. So if there's going to be a slave state admitted, there's going to be a free state admitted at the same time. And I don't mean the exact same date. I mean relatively the same time. Um, and frankly, that is, you know, why Texas was admitted so much later than um, we were actually, you know, gained our independence from Mexico is because we had to wait around until there were going to be some um, free states admitted at the same time. So um, six of the original 13 colonies um, were slave states, and so those were um, in bold. Um, and you, so you see Delaware, Georgia, Maryland, South Carolina, Virginia, and North Carolina were all slave states. And the rest of them, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, and Rhode Island were free states. Um, when California was admitted in um, 1850, there was not really a balance, um, somebody else to be admitted that could kind of offset that. So the way that um, happened was California had to have one pro-slavery um, delegate and one um, pro uh, or anti-slavery um, delegate in order to keep the power in Congress balanced. Okay, so we have the Civil War. It's horrible. It's terrible. In 1865, it is over. So we are post-Civil War. This post-Civil War to 1937 
is just testing how much power the states have. Um, because as soon as the Civil War is over, um, it doesn't mean that everybody in the South has automatically decided that all men are created equal. Um, this, is, this is where you have um, the Southerners trying to test and see what they can get away with, how they can keep segregation alive, how they can keep um, you know, the slaves still oppressed, even though they're not legally slaves. So this is the second part of the progression of federalism where um, the different states were testing their state power. So here we are, the North just won the Civil War. Federalism was operating as a dual federal system, meaning that there's no purple in this event diagram. There's just, um, there's just the red and there's just the blue. And so we're just, you know, you have two systems of government operating in their own spheres um, right next to each other. The problem was, the economy started growing. There was an industrial revolution and businesses were getting bigger than their state borders. So um, a doc, I mean, a, a company would um, become so big that they would dominate the markets. They would exploit the workers and um, this was, and they would take that activity, um, you know, out or that activity would affect things that were happening in other states. And so maybe the company's not even operating in the state next door, but it's, it's creating such havoc in its state that it is forcing people to the next door state and um, really causing, causing problems. Um, so the federal government says, wait a second, if, you know, if this, if we're going to start doing business this way, then the national government government needs to be able to come in and um, you know regulate this interstate commerce, even if there's not actually commerce going from state to state. It's just the effect of um, intrastate commerce is affecting another state. So, what was um, the result? The result is that neither the national government nor the state government had um, substantial power to regulate business. So when it all shook down, neither one of those governments was found to be really the one in charge of businesses. So who wins when nobody's in charge? The business. Um, you know, it's just like if you have a toddler, who wins when the when everybody's too tired to tell the toddler? Um, what to do and nobody really has power over the toddler, well, the toddler wins. So um, businesses found that they should be allowed to act without interference from any of the governments. Um, corporations said that they were people and protected by the 14th Amendment. And so states could not regulate them because they could not infringe on their rights, their personal rights. Um, However, um, even though the national government brought up the Commerce Clause saying, you know, um, the national government has the power to um, regulate interstate commerce, um, the corporation said that they um, didn't read any specific economic power that was given to Congress or given to the national government in the Commerce Clause. And so since there were not any specific economic activities regulated, um, you know, basically nothing could be regulated. Let's take a tiny little detour um, and talk about the 14th Amendment, was, which was enacted in 1868. Um, so the 14th Amendment says, no state shall make or enforce a law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of laws. So there's a lot in the 14th Amendment. Um, very, very meaty. There is, um, you can't deprive people of life, liberty, or process without due process of law. I'm sorry, life, liberty, or property without due process of law meaning that 
you have to have some kind of a fair procedure before a state takes away somebody's life, puts them in jail, or takes their property, takes their money. Um, also in the 14th Amendment is a state can't deny um, equal protection of the laws, which is what, you know, you can't um, say that um, one person is able to benefit from the laws of the state, but it denies the benefits to another person. Um, and that's, you know, kind of where we get um, equal protection in like um, gay marriage, um, same sex marriage. The, um, the proponents of same sex marriage said that um, a state can't deny a person the right to marry and the protection of, you know, the laws of that allow people to marry um, within their state. Okay, so another part um, says that the state shall not make and enforce a law which abridges the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the, of the United States. So a state is not going to be able to um, oppress um, somebody who is a United States citizen with their laws. Um, so this was enacted because um, there were all these newly freed slaves just right after the um, end of the Civil War, and um, the newly freed slaves in those especially southern states um, were not being treated fairly, were not being treated as equal citizens. Um, there, was, uh, there was a group of cases called the Slaughterhouse Cases, that held that states could still determine the rights that their citizens were entitled to. So um, New York could enact a law that affected all New Yorkers, but they couldn't enact a law that only affected um, New Yorkers with a certain color skin, for example. There was a, um, a case called Plessy versus Ferguson, and um, the that was the Supreme Court saying um, states could only force black people to use separate facilities if those separate facilities were equal to what was um, offered to um, white people. So um, this was, you know, how school segregation was allowed. Um, people were no longer slaves, but they couldn't, you know, you couldn't drink from the same water fountain, you couldn't attend the same schools. And so um, now, the 14th Amendment is enacted to try to prevent the states from enacting um, explicit laws that um, only applied to the benefit um, or the detriment of one group of people. So we're going to take that back to um, corporations saying that um, they are people and so a state cannot make a law that deprives the corporation of any of their property or um, gives them equal protection or abridges their privileges or, or immunities. So some examples of um, the litigation of the 14th Amendment, which as you can see, once, um, once there is a new document, a new constitution, a new amendment, there's a lot of litigation around it. So there's a lot of people going to the courts to try to get the courts to interpret exactly how far can we go in our practical lives one way or the other under this law. So let's talk about the sugar monopoly. Um, in these cases, the Supreme Court prevented the national government from breaking up a monopoly of the manufacture of sugar, saying regulating commerce so the power of, of Congress to regulate commerce only applied to the transportation and not the manufacturer. So states were the ones who could regulate the manufacturer since that is something that is happening within the state borders. Now, when that state tries, to, when that company within state borders tries to trek their, um, their sugar across state borders, well, then that's where the federal government gets involved, but only in the um, transportation part of it and not on the production part of it.
But then we had um, child labor. The Supreme Court um, prevented the national government from prohibiting interstate shipment of goods manufactured by child labor, saying that um, the Supremacy Clause gave the states the power to regulate factories. So since regulating factories, again, was not something explicitly given to the federal government by virtue of Article I, Section 8, and was not prohibited to the states by um, anything else, then it was default the state's right to regulate factories. Now, the federal government tried to kind of backdoor regulate by saying, you can do whatever you want at your factory. However, if your factory tries to ship goods across state lines, we're not going to allow that in order to put pressure on the factory to um, comply with child labor laws. And then that went further um, with, you know, kind of the regulation of all labor practices. The Supreme Court prevented states from regulating labor practices because this violated a factory owner's property rights. And, you know, the, the um, labor was the um, factory owner's property. And so the way that the factory owner was able to conduct its labor force, now it didn't own the people, but it owned their work, um, was found to be um, the factory owner's property rights. And so because it was a, a private you know, citizen, the corporation's um, property right, their labor you know, force, then a state couldn't make a law that infringed on it. So what's the problem here? I mean, there are lots of problems, obviously. Um, the problem is when the national government is not allowed to regulate business, um, it doesn't want to necessarily help business either. So, um, you know, if, if the national government has to stay away from business, well, then they're staying away from them for everything. Um, and that includes in, in the event that the businesses have problems. So you get to the Great Depression and um, the federal government says, well, sorry, you businesses wanted to do your own thing. You didn't want us to get involved, so we're not going to get involved. We're going to leave it up to the market and, um, you know, we'll see if the markets can get um, your business going again. But the problem is um, the businesses affect people, and people are the responsibility of um, the governments. Franklin Roosevelt was elected um, president in the midst of the Great Depression um, because he was a part of a party that um, believed that the national government had to step in to the economy and since, you know, there's so many pieces of the economy that are under the um, national power, um, the, the national government had the um, power to step into regulation of the economy. And they, everybody saw that, you know, it was three years after um, the stock market crash and the start of the Great Depression and the market had not um, righted itself. It was, everybody was just um, plunging further and further into um, the number of people who were out of work and, and further and further into poverty. And so um, the voters said, okay, wait a second, we're, we're willing to um, listen to a party that says that maybe the national government should have a little bit more power than it currently does. So um, there is something called the switch in time that saved nine. And um, this was something that has been talked about um, in the light in light of um, some Supreme Court nominations and Supreme Court confirmations that um, happened fairly quickly during the Trump administration. And so um, what happened was um, Franklin Roosevelt was elected president and he um, 
lined out all of these New Deal programs that were um, being held unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Um, so as you saw, you know, like the in the same line of thinking as the um, allowing sugar monopolies and allowing child labor and saying that the federal government has no power over these businesses. Um, so that kind of thinking continued um, through the Supreme Court and with the New Deal program. So FDR would try to enact a program that was going to help the economy, hopefully, um, and the Supreme Court would help, would hold any kind of regulation unconstitutional because that was the federal government doing too much to interfere with a business, which is considered a person. Um, so the cases kept failing by a five to four vote. Um, so Franklin Roosevelt said, well, I could fix this if I could appoint um, two more Supreme Court justices. And so then it would be a six to five vote. Um, and so he petitioned to increase the number of Supreme Court justices. There's nowhere in the Constitution that says there can only be nine Supreme Court justices. So um, in order to prevent that from happening, um, Justice Owen Roberts switched sides on the, the New Deal cases, allowing the New Deal programs to proceed. And um, then Franklin Roosevelt had no um, problem, and so he could not um, really have a basis for requesting more justices. Now, um, so basically, Justice Roberts switch from one side to the other, saying these programs are illegal, to saying these programs are, are permissible, saved um, the Supreme Court from being diluted by adding more justices. Um, when I said that this is something that's been talked about recently, so when um, Justice Ginsburg passed away, uh, um, before she passed away, she said she did not want, um, you know, the current president at the time, um, Donald Trump, to be able to um, appoint her successor. And so um, since it was an election year, it was, you know, potentially the end of his um, the end of his term um, or his, his reign as president, um, she did not want um, him to be able to um, fast track another justice and appoint somebody who was conservative versus liberal. And so he did. Um, Amy Coney Barrett was, um, was a Appointed and um, confirmed as a Supreme Court justice, and so at that time, um, people who were, you know, um, on the same side as as Justice Ginsburg um, in their political ideology and their beliefs said, "Okay, fine, we'll just get if Trump is not reelected, we'll just get the next president to increase the number of Supreme Court justices so that." we can retain, you know, a kind of a balance of power in the Supreme Court. I don't know if it's going to happen, but that is just kind of the second time it's come up. So with the switch by Justice Roberts, um, all of a sudden union disputes between labor and management that disrupted the nation's economy were now um, Congress's problem and Congress could regulate unions um, via the Commerce Clause because those, you know, any kind of a dispute and um, between management and the union would affect interstate commerce. Congress's Commerce Clause power is as broad as the need of the nation and therefore Congress can regulate all aspects of commerce because basically everything can become an issue that affects interstate commerce. Um, the taxing and spending clause, meaning that, you know, of Article 1, Section 8, saying that Congress has the power to tax and spend, um, gives great power to Congress because it's only limited by the court requirement that it shall be exercised to provide for the general welfare of the United States. And that um, that's pretty broad. 
there are a lot of things that Congress can do by claiming that their action is providing for the general welfare of the United States. So we get past the Great Depression and we're going to move into the third part of the progression of federalism. Um, and so we've seen, you know, power shift back and forth from the states to the federal government to the states to the federal government. And so now we're in the third portion, which is, you know, post Great Depression to today. So Lyndon B. Johnson, um, when he was president, um, created what he called a great society. He wanted to have um, so many social welfare programs to basically eradicate poverty, uh, make sure that everybody was taken care of. Um, and while Congress or the federal government cannot regulate social welfare, it can tax and spend, and so it can choose to tax and spend for the benefit of these programs. Um, the results of this, you know, great society taxing and spending by Congress was to um, give grants to the states for, for education so that states that did not have as much money could still provide superior education. Um, it provided public housing, health care, public assistance so that people who were living in poverty could get assistance from the government, from the federal government to um, hopefully climb out of poverty. And um, what it did was help citizens, but also restrict the states um, from acting a certain way if they were going to receive these grants. So. Um, it you know put strings attached to the money so that if a state was going to do something that was not in line with um, helping citizens in the way that these programs sought to help citizens then um, the federal government could restrict that money from the states So there's something called dual federalism, and the opposite of that is cooperative federalism. And if you kind of think of it like a cake, dual federalism is where everybody is operating within their own layer. So the light pink and the purple on this um, do not mix. You know, the top layer and the bottom layer do not mix. Everybody just stays in their lane, stays in their layer, and... Um, operates, you know, with, within their, their realm of powers. Cooperative federalism is where the two work together, and it's hard to differentiate between federal and state powers because they're all marbled together, like in the second picture. So with cooperative federalism, um, that is where there is the marbled cake. That's where there is um, shared responsibilities instead of divided responsibilities. Um, programs are jointly funded, jointly administered, and joint, there's a joint determination of eligibility. And um, so think about it like the economy. The economy is not just Congress's problem, and it's not just the state's problem. It's everybody's problem. So cooperative federalism acknowledges that there are some issues where the federal and the state governments have to work together. Medicaid, for example, is um, funded by the national government. The national government um, determines eligibility standards, um, and then the states are allowed to set out how people get their benefits and what benefits they're getting. Um, states provide the direct services, so um, provide the, you know, hospitals and, and things like that, and the national government um, provides general administration of the program. So with that, it's an example of both the national and the state governments working together for, um, you know, cooperating to um, benefit citizens. Now, with cooperative federalism, it ended up being um, an expansion 
of the national government's role in um, everyday life of the people who live in the United States. Um, the national government can be in charge of more programs because it's able to raise more money than any other form of government. It has a broader tax base, so it can tax every single person in the United States and raise much more money than just what a state or um, a group, uh, you know, a small government can um, raise. So um, the money that um, the federal government gives varies in type and its level of restriction. So sometimes they give categorical grants, which um, are bunches of money that the federal government gives to the states, certain states, and the money can only be used for a certain activity. But then other times the federal government will give a block grant and they'll specify the general area where the funds can be used, but the local government is allowed to determine where specifically the money goes, how specifically the money is used. So one example of a block grant is there are a lot of block grants for education. And so the federal government will give the states money for education and say, use it on education. But the states can then determine, are we going to use it to um, pay our teachers better? Are we going to build better schools? Are we going to offer more training to teachers? What are we going to do um, and where is that money going to go? Um, state governments get between 20 and 45 percent of their state budget, fund, state budget from federal funds. And um, this is a big significant um, part of the budget. In Texas, it's a very significant part of the budget. And what this does is this lets um, Congress and the federal government put strings attached to this money. And in order for the states to get this big chunk of money for their state budget, um, they have to follow the direction of Congress in order to get the funds. It's called fiscal federalism. Um, and that is the national government exerting power because it's controlling the money. An example of this came with the minimum drinking age. So the minimum drinking age um, used to be 18 and the federal government wanted to raise the drinking age to 21. The federal government couldn't really think of a way that they had the power to enact a law that said people couldn't drink um, alcohol until they were 21. So what the federal government did was say, okay, states, you are in charge of setting the minimum drinking age. We think it should be 21. And so, um, if you want to get any money for your highways, you have to raise the drinking age. Now, we're not saying you have to raise the drinking age because you don't have to get money for your highways. But if you are going to get money from your highways, for your highways from the federal government, you have to raise your drinking age. And that's how we got a minimum drinking age of 21. For years and years, the holdout was Louisiana. And it was interesting driving from Texas to Louisiana because you really could tell, sure, you could buy a, a beer there when you're 18, but you also had to, um, you know, have some pretty crappy roads in some areas because, um, you know, Louisiana didn't have that big influx of federal money um, in order to supplement their road crews and their, their road um, building and maintaining funds. Ronald Reagan said, um, federalism is rooted in the knowledge that our political liberties are best assured by limiting the size and scope of the national government. Ronald Reagan was a, a big proponent of a small national government. Um, but, um, but with an increase in um, block grants, um, limiting Congress's regulation of the states in ways that interfere with their traditional government functions, um, you are able to limit the federal government's power 
by still allowing the federal government to have some sort of interaction with and relationship with the people in the states. Um, there are um, some plans that came kind of post Reagan plans that were called the Republican devolution plans. And this was to continue kind of the thought of what Reagan um, proposed with a smaller, more limited government, um, national government. And what it did was to look at the, the um, money and the mandates that were being offered or enforced by the federal government and reduce those. So um, there were unfunded mandates where the federal government gives everybody a regulation like um, you have to clean up factories or, you know, make sure that um, the pollution, give, you know, brought about by um, factories is reduced. But it didn't give any money to pay for that. And so um, as a result, you know, that's just basically the government um, telling these private businesses what to do. And um, so by eliminating um, or reducing unfunded mandates, then um, that is reducing the interaction that the federal government has in, um, the, you know, the private lives of the um, American people. Um, there was sweeping welfare reform um, to put the um, power back on the states to be in charge of the training and to be in charge of the welfare programs um, that were trying to transition people from public assistance into jobs. And that was, um, you know, through the Reagan and Bush eras, the way that um, the leadership and the congressional um, Republicans were trying to um, reduce the amount of power and influence that the federal government had on um, the United States people. But then we got to 9-11, where all of a sudden something has happened um, during the, you know, the tenure of a Republican president, George W. Bush, and um, all of a sudden we have a need for a federal government that is going to be um, more involved in the lives of people. And so um, this devolution reversed because all of a sudden you need the federal government to be able to go in and monitor um, and protect people like the Department of Homeland Security. You need the federal government to regulate airport security um, and, you know, things like that. Um, with this kind of trend of the government becoming more and more involved, um, then after Bush, you have um, Barack Obama, who um, was instrumental in, in getting Congress to pass the Affordable Care Act. Um, this is what's Obamacare that people talk about. Um, there was a democratically controlled Congress, and so um, Obama pushed this legislation through in order to give um, the federal government more power to regulate um, whether or not people were, you know, able to obtain affordable health care. So where do we see issues today where the federal government and the state governments are um, trying to decide who is in charge in a certain area and how much power the federal government should be able to exert over something, that an issue that is seen as kind of a private citizen issue or a state issue? Um, one place, like I talked about earlier, was marijuana laws. So Marijuana laws differ from state to state, um, and so, you know, some states allow recreational use, some, some just decriminalize the possession of marijuana, um, so saying that it's, it's not going to be, you know, enforced as a, um, you're not going to be arrested for it, it's not going to be enforced as a, as a crime. Some say it's okay for um, medical purposes, but not for recreational use. 
And then if a state says it's okay for medical purposes, then you have to answer all the questions of what medical purposes are allowed. So um, this is a great example of something awesome about federalism because federalism allows the federal government to sit back and watch different states experimenting with different laws about an issue before the federal government comes in and says, okay, this affects interstate commerce, so this is what the regulation is going to be. Or if you want money for your highways, you will allow you know, marijuana to be legal or you will prohibit um, the legalization of marijuana, things like that. Another issue is sanctuary cities. Um, so sanctuary cities came about when um, there were laws that were cracking down on illegal immigration and all of a sudden cities were saying, yeah, we're not going to cooperate with your um, law that says that um, we have to arrest and deport people or report people to the federal government um, in order to um, so that they can be deported. Um, and so when a state government uh, or a city government even says, um, yeah, we're not going to follow those federal laws, what is the national government allowed to do? And that's a good question. Um, there's that's something that is being discussed. What you know, can a federal government withhold funding? Can a federal government punish the state if they don't get their sanctuary cities under control? Um, it's a it's a big issue that doesn't yet have an answer, but it is another way that federalism allows um, groups of people, cities, states, to um, have differing views based on the views of their people and allows the federal government to sit back and watch what happens. What happens when a city refuses to follow immigration laws? What happens when um, marijuana is allowed to be sold for recreational purposes and is taxed? And so um, it's allowing the government to gather data and determine what the next step will be. So that is all I have about federalism, federalism in an hour and a half. And so um, I appreciate you listening. I will give you a test over this and the other two lectures in unit one. And um, federalism is an interesting, um, incredible experiment that was invented by the United States and is um, something that allows the United States to be such an amazing, interesting, um, diverse place to live. So thanks a lot. Good luck on the exam.